Hey everyone, just a short kind of discussion video about the Owl House because I have thoughts on how it's been going that doesn't really work for Glass of Water since it's all kind of open-ended and I don't really have a thesis, but I wanted to get some of my ruminations out there and maybe give people a better understanding of my critical process. And also because people were asking me to and I have no idea what else to make a video out of. There's literally just two things on my brain right now and for some reason I just can't make my thoughts linger for very long on anything else. Trust me, I am so goddamn sick and tired of being me. So The Owl House is nearing the end of its first season and so far it's been one of the best shows I've seen in a long time. And one of the reasons for that is that it respects my time and so far it hasn't done any of the things that would normally give me pause and go, hey, wait a minute. You see, usually by the end of the first season I can sort of gauge where a show is going. Tangled was giving off red flags like halfway through with Queen for a Day. Uh, Star vs. the Forces of Evil was giving off those flags when Toppy showed up and supplanted the fun antagonist. Th there's always a clue, always a tell, and so far there hasn't been. In fact, every single tell that has shown up has been immediately squashed down. I actually felt the same way about She-Ra, if I'm being honest. Like, the only major problems with She-Ra is that its attempts to provide LGBT representation are, like, toxic and unsatisfying as fuck, and it brute force redeems every single villain. But I won't get into that. You all know my feelings about redemption at this point. I'm only interested in redemption for characters who never should have been made into villains in the first place. But one of the things that prompted me to do this was because the last few episodes have been teasing a gay relationship in the show, and people are, of course, losing their minds about it and demanding I give my take on the matter. And I want to talk about that and the most recent episode as well. So yeah, cards on the table, I don't like Amity. It's not that Amity is a bad character, like it's, it's not that she's objectionable, it's just that she's so boring. Like, especially when she's compared to the other characters around her. See, back in the first impressions, I described Ida by comparing her to a bunch of other similar characters, but that comparison has always carried an asterisk next to it. She's kind of like these characters, but... It's not saying that she's a clone or a cliché, it's using the other characters to draw a picture for the audience. That's why we have comparisons. For example, Lilith is like Illyria Windrunner, but an even bigger piece of shit somehow. Amity, I just can't do that for. She's not like other characters, she is those other characters. At the start of the show, she's an exact carbon copy of the upstart prep school rich bully character. Like, she's literally just Malfoy or Diana. And Malfoy was only interesting when he was a grimy pissant, someone to lose to give the main characters a win. When they tried making him important to the story, it just sucked all the enjoyment out. Diana's probably a closer comparison because their execution is so similar that I'm not convinced that Amity wasn't just a literal copy and paste job. One of my biggest complaints about what remains to be the only Japanese cartoon I've ever covered on my channel was that it actually started off with some really interesting and fun characters and then chucked them all aside in favor of a really dumb story arc that focused way too much on the least interesting characters I'd ever seen. It was crazy just how boring everything got. Like, don't get me wrong, I've seen this happen so many times that I'm not surprised anymore, but the drop itself was a lot steeper than I was expecting. And I'm seeing inklings of that again with just how much focus Amity is getting over the characters that are just more fun. Like, we already had Willow. Did we really need Amity? Especially when focusing on her cuss the show so much. One defense I've heard is that Amity actually stops being the prep school alpha bitch pretty early on, but that isn't the defense some people think it is. These characters were all fun when they were low-stakes antagonists. It was when their respective creators tried to make them leading characters that everything fell down a pit. Like, Amity's story arc in the Owl House isn't improving on the trope, it's getting to the part where shit gets boring a lot faster. It's strange that in a show that has managed to maintain such a colorful sense of humor, this really unimaginative story managed to sneak its way through. Improving on the trope would be to look at the way these characters are often under an absurd amount of pressure and target the things that are putting them under that pressure, rather than just having them go through a be nicer character arc that does nothing but tone police women for having emotions. And this is supposed to be the kind of gay rep that people are creaming themselves over? I mean, I can't say if it's good rep or not because nothing's actually come of it. And this is the point I'm trying to make. Nothing has come of any of this yet, so chill out. It's just Amity pining. So who knows whether this will be done in a timely manner or dragged out until the last episode. If Terrace doesn't drag this out and like these two get together by the end of season one with season two left to build on that, then that would be fine. That's the bare minimum I expect. And it hits all my requirements. It'd be fine. C-grade gay rep, it's okay. 
and I get the feeling this part will be lost on people. I don't hate Amity, there's nothing about her to hate. There's nothing about her to like, either, aside from Mae Whitman's voice acting. In terms of love interest characters, she's completely insubstantial. The only way you could get more insubstantial is if she wasn't a love interest and people just thought she was. The only interesting things about her are the characters that orbit around her. That's always been the worst aspect of any show. Like, a horrible show is something I can at least get worked up over. I got 50 pages easy out of Rebecca Sugar being a gross pervert. But if the Owl House is going to be primarily focused on Amity, then that just kind of takes the wind out of my sails, honestly. But to come back to the whole gay panic thing, everyone keeps asking me what I think of Amity losing her mind in that one sports episode, and that's a hard question to answer because it could go either way. I made the argument myself that gay crushes in media are always muted and toned down, so while it is technically a step forward, like a real step step forward, that Amity is an actual blushy disaster around Luz, personally I'm not content with just a step forward. If this ends up being all there is for the entire show, that's not good enough. If Luz and Amity become a thing before the show ends, then this is all cute stuff I would happily watch again. It's like popcorn, it can be tasty and crunchy and a much needed treat, but it is disposable. But if they wait until the very last episode to do anything with them, then I would write this off as blatant gay baiting. That's popcorn covered in butter that's gone cold and soggy. You see what I mean? The perception of Amity's gay panic is entirely dependent on whether this will be something good or more baiting. It's the problem I had with She-Ra, where the gay relationships are all either shunted off to the side or are explicitly abusive and baited to the last second of the series. And that's happened too many times for me to get excited preemptively. I have a tendency to spoil the ending for a story for myself because I'm strongly of the opinion that a good story doesn't have to worry about spoilers. A good story can't be spoiled, and the only stories that can are the ones that rely on shock value first and foremost. I saw the latest episode, Agony of a Witch, after hearing what happens from my girlfriend, and so knowing that Lilith was the one who cursed Ida didn't take anything away from the experience because the mystery itself didn't matter. Lilith's confession in that scene, like, isn't the important part. Ida's violent rage upon hearing it and how angry she is that her adopted daughter has been held hostage to lure her out is. And that goes double for the Emperor. The tension by the end of this episode isn't that the Emperor is a tyrant who's enacted colonialism on the Boiling Isles. The tension comes from the fact that Ida's in trouble, and the reason she's even in trouble is because she burned out all her magic protecting Luz, and now she's stuck as the Owl Beast. I used to talk a lot about personal stakes and storytelling, you know, like how the world doesn't need to be under attack, and how oftentimes viewers won't care if it actually is, but that the personal investment in a character means that what they care about will become what the audience cares about. Oftentimes, people's favorite characters can cause them to have more emotionally visceral reactions to different things. If someone's favorite WoW character is, say, Illidan, then that last quest where you deliver his final words to his brother and best friend can really make some people angry, because Tyrande and Malfurion just completely write him off as a lost cause. By contrast, if your favorite character is Sylvanas, you probably loathe Varisa and Illyria Windrunner, because the two of them are spiteful, cruel monsters to their sister on the regular. Ida dooms herself to become the Owl Beast permanently because Lilith threw Luz into a spike pit, and earlier in the episode she'd been working on a special cloak for Luz. She loves that girl like her own daughter and can't bear to see her be hurt, and that's the real emotional gut punch of the episode, especially as Luz is constantly pleading for Ida to basically just let her die because burning out her magic will doom her. That's what's going to get someone truly invested. You can hype up mysteries all you want, but all it's going to do is get people addicted and desperately seek out that high. Steven Universe ended a while ago, and and nobody has given two ounces of a shit since then. And there's a reason for that, because for all the furor and aggression its diehard fans poured into it, and for all the people they harassed, bullied, and abused for criticizing it, there was no genuine love there. The moment it ended, they ran right off to their next fix. That's the downside of mystery mongering at play. You have no staying power, because after a certain point, the people who might have genuinely enjoyed a show get turned off by all the teasing and just go do something else, and all you have left are the adrenaline junkies. And the downsides of that, of that addiction and desperation for a fix are already showing themselves. Simple stories are criticized by the gremlins for having no stakes. Me and Michaela have been doing a rewrite of the sequel trilogy, and every now and then someone will run in complaining that the story has no stakes. It doesn't need to have stakes. You're just a fucking junkie looking for their next fix. 
go away. To everyone else, all this stuff with the Emperor just slides off their brain. Lilith only matters to the story because of her relationship to Ida, and that Ida had spent so long avoiding the Emperor, only to basically surrender just for the sake of saving Luz, is what makes the Emperor something worth caring about. They're not going to bring freedom to the Boiling Isles, I mean, they might do that passively, but the important part is saving Ida. This is where I find myself unable to make a judgement on the show. Usually I can do that early on. I can usually figure out where a show is going in the first season, and I even called what She-Ra was doing at the very first episode. If a show is going to go down the plug hole, then the symptoms show themselves pretty early. But the Owl House doesn't give me that vibe. Everything that could be strung along to get people addicted with high stimulation and no satisfying payoff has actually been wrapped up in a timely manner. Well, almost everything. I gotta go! Ugh, they're gonna drag that out for four years, I just know it. But yeah, the Owl House doesn't fill me with dread beyond a trained reaction at this point. I'm actually relaxed and having fun for once, and I'm not waiting for the other shoe to drop. I'm actually looking forward to watching more of it. The dramatic moments are actually enjoyable rather than a headache to be tolerated, and I genuinely care what happens to these characters, and I've been able to say that about a show in a long time. I'm really enjoying myself with the Owl House, and I'm looking forward to more. It's oddly unsettling. Uh, before I go, uh, just one more thing. In the last episode, when Ida's taken captive by Lilith, she tells Luz to go away because Ida's with her real family. And I love that she said that. Little writing tip, you can generally find the theme of a show based on who is saying what. Like, everyone lost their mind about The Last Jedi supposedly having an anti-nostalgia theme with the line, you know, let the past die and all that crap. But the reason that read of the film is so stupid is because it's not said by anyone in the film with any sincerity. It's said by Kylo Ren, the bad guy, who's only saying it to gaslight Rey, because gaslighting Rey is literally the only thing he ever does in the movie. Luke does the same thing, but the whole point of that story is that he's wrong and stupid and dumb. They had him say that verbally in the next movie just because people didn't seem to grasp that concept the first time around. So having Lilith denounce the notion of a found family and claim that she was Ida's real family, despite cursing her, imprisoning her, and selling her out to a tyrant, and this happening immediately after Ida says to Luke, that she's the best thing to ever come into her life really hits home that found family is the theme of the show. And we're not about to have some convoluted reconciliation between Ida and Lilith for the sake of family because what Lilith did to her was unforgivable. And look, being someone from an abusive family and having to watch people praise Steven Universe for gaslighting abuse victims with but family rhetoric, this is just nice. Like, it's, it's nice. I hope it stays on this track and doesn't force uh, redemption for Lilith. Because it's nice. I don't have a higher point to make. I just like it. I just think it's neat. I like this show. See ya.